there are three more, uh, main um, sort of uh, 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 categories of molecular dynamic force fields in different types. One is OPLS, one is AMBER series, and the other one is CHIME series. And they have been dominating the molecular dynamics force fields for a long time now. Uh, nonetheless, what I want to uh, address today is that molecular dynamics force fields suffered from underestimated protein solubility that has been in part addressed and people know about it. And then another issue, which is perhaps less known, which is that is they suffer from inaccurate description of conformational dynamics of short unfolded peptides in aqueous solutions in water, for example. And that obviously is a problem, particularly because we're really very much interested in studying intrinsically disordered proteins and peptides. So these are the proteins that would not fold into a stiff uh, three-dimensional structure, but have at least parts or larger regions of, of uh, their sequence that are intrinsically disordered. They don't adopt a particular structure. And therefore, they're close to impossible to crystallize uh, and also to study experimentally, particularly the disordered parts, even, even with cryo-EM, for example. So one of the prototypical proteins that is known as an intrinsically disordered protein is amyloid beta protein. This is a very dangerous slide for me, I'm warning you, because I could talk about these topics for hours and hours and hours, and I don't want to do that because the topic is the issues with molecular dynamics. Uh, but let me just briefly sort of uh, uh, set up the stage, which is that uh, small, um, small self-assemblies of amyloid beta protein called oligomers are involved in a pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And so I'm not um, uh, unexpected, because amyloid beta protein does not fold in any particular three-dimensional structure, is unfolded, uh, the oligomer structure remains experimentally unresolved. So molecular dynamics provides a, lot, a great tool to kind of uh, figure out what's going on with amyloid beta protein and oligomers, and therefore provides some molecular level basis for Alzheimer's pathology. The problem is, of course, that molecular dynamic simulations are limited in size and times. So even to study a self-assembly of, you know, of decent number of A-beta molecules in fully atomistic MD is uh, time-consuming and impractical, so to speak. So we have also utilized in the past the four, bead, four beads per amino acid model with uh, amino acid site specificity to kind of uh, capture the process of oligomer formation starting from unstructured 32 peptide chains and then let it assemble. And so this model uh, is sort of a, was successful because it predicted some experimental data, some experimental discriminants between the two major aloforms of I-beta, which is 40 and 42 amino acids long. Uh, but more importantly, in the context of molecular dynamic simulations of IDPs, we used 40 to 50 monomers, 40 to 50 dimers taken from uh, this coarse grain model, converted them into fully atomistic, and then put them in the molecular dynamics box with water to study their stability and to study their fully atomistic structures. Uh, so the, so the, that has been published long time, 10 years ago now already. But so this picture shows how it, ape, how it goes from coarse grain model to fully atomistic uh, you know, uh, structure, and then you put it in water and study. So this study has been extended to uh, all oligom to monomers, to pentamers of A beta 40 and 42, uh, using this same methodology, which is important. Uh, so th what I want to stress here, it, the phase space of IDPs is significantly better sampled if you do large number of short molecular dynamics trajectories because the free energy landscapes of intrinsically disordered protein is very rugged. So it has many local minima and each empty trajectory gets trapped in the local minimum. So if the more trajectories you have, the better sampling of the phase space to, to make the long story short. So we have discovered something quite exciting 
uh, when we examined oligomers larger than dimers, trimers, tetramers, and pen pentamers, we figured out start spontaneously forming water permeable pores. And that is exciting, of course, to me, but I'll have to tell you why. That's why you should find that exciting. Uh, this is because the way, the, the main uh, hypothesis on how these oligomers cause the damage to the neuronal membrane is that they get embedded inside the membrane, form ion channels, and allow calcium ions to leak in and destroy the cell. So when we saw that this kind of a pores that, that, can, uh, that are permeable to calcium ions and water can form even in water, that was exciting. Moreover, that propensity to form pores increased with the oligomer size. And because amyloid beta protein 42 forms la larger amount of larger oligomers than A beta 40, that provides a good basis of why this later one is more associated with the disease, which was one of the puzzles that uh, you know, is uh, going on. But let me go back to the molecular dynamics force fields. These simulations have been done in the old OPLS force field. And so the question is, how reliable are these predictions? So in other words, if we would now switch to a more recent force field, would we still get the same type of predictions? And so that made us start thinking about the force fields and try to find a way to compare them with experimental data. So the first, so this is not historically, but I will first address the issue of protein solubility because it's, it's kind of a well-known that whatever you throw in MD, whatever kind of proteins, you take two protein chains, you throw them in molecular dynamics, uh, box, if they're close enough together, they'll start uh, forming dimers, regardless of what kind of proteins we're dealing about. So this is, so of course, this may depend on the molecular dynamics force fields. I don't want to insult any force field, but most of the force fields will um, uh, severely underestimate solubility of proteins. So anything will self-assemble in molecular dynamics, even if it shouldn't. So we chose Dillian Hatfield's domain, HP36, known to many people who are the, uh, working in development of molecular dynamics force fields, because this protein is a native protein, old fashioned protein that adopts a native structure, stays helical, very stable helical. And, and so molecular, older molecular dynamics force fields were using this uh, Vivian hat piece to show that that structure is really stable in their force field. And that's, of course, a good support to the force field. So the, the reason that is also interesting is that experiments show that is extremely soluble. And why is that important? That means that it will remain monomeric at very high concentrations, even above 10 millimolar. And so that's great because in simulations, the higher the concentration, the easier it is to simulate, right? Uh, uh, the merization process. Because if you have two chains that are too far apart in you know, low concentration, you'll wait for your lifetime for them to start interacting, right? So high concentrations and monomeric is a great testing tool. So we use this really in head piece. Uh, we did some experimental data to show that up to at least one millimolar, uh, this villain headpiece protein is 90% monomeric. But then we were doing simulations, and the way we were, uh, so this, this lower picture shows a little bit. Uh, so each of these clumps is one villain headpiece protein in their folded state. And the way we decided whether it forms a dimer or not is, in these cases, when the, the two atoms that belong to different proteins the protein chains uh, approach to closer distance, then we call it a dimer. If it's farther away, it's a monomer. And then based on the tracing this minimal distance between those two proteins, that gives you enough information to calculate the dissociation, to estimate the dissociation constant from these simulations. So this is what we've done. And again, I don't wanna spend too much time on that. So we tested two force fields, AMBER 14SB and CHARM 36M. Uh, we tested them with the, uh, CHARM 36M developed its own native TIP3P water model. And in AMBER, we uh, tested the generic TIP3P water model, but then we also 
uh, tested both force fields with another uh, water model, T42005, which has a superb uh, predictions for water properties. So water properties within this water model are really well produced, was developed by Vega and Abascal in uh, 2005. So, um, so again, uh, the, 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 I'm showing you the table that I don't think you should read or even attempt to read, but I highlighted with red what I would like you to pay attention, which is this last column, uh, specifically for the dissociation constant. Um, when we, uh, first of all, it, I am highlighting just the amber results based with, uh, combined with two water models to show that the moment we replace tip 3 p by tip 4 p 2005 the dissociation constant increases by a factor of five. The reason that I'm showing two results is because we have done, uh, we have uh, explored very different conditions, starting from unfolded uh, villain headpiece peptides, which was not, um, uh, which didn't give uh, uh, really physical results because this protein is mostly folded and the simulation times needed to for this protein to fold are much larger than the simula total simulation time in, the sim in uh, these kind of simulations. So the more, so if we start with the native fold, uh, then the largest um, KD value that we found was about 10 millimolar. Well, that would mean that the 10 millimolar half of the protein would be dissociated. That's the meaning of the dissociation constant. And that's the highest value that is produced. Even though if we, if we just stick with tip 3 p water model, charm overall always gives better results than amber. But only when amber was combined with this better water model, we get like a five-fold increase in the dissociation constant and the best results. So water is very important. Okay, so I'm done with the solubility. But, uh, and now I want to go back to asking a very simple question. What are, how are the conformational propensities of amino acid residues in short peptides of the type GXG, where X can be any, any amino acid. For example, in this case, A is alanine, which is the simplest amino acid after glycine, because glycine is the one that doesn't have a side chain. So typically, we describe conformational space by a Chandler distribution. You have two dihedral angles of that central gas amino acid to consider, phi and psi, and you look at uh, how, how the conformations are distributed in this phi phi five size space, and that's the Ramachandran distribution. Um, and so, so, so the reason that we've chosen this particular model, peptides, is because we have a collaboration with the, chem with the chemistry department, specifically with Reichel Schweizer-Stenner, who has spent his lifetime assembling spectroscopic data on short peptides. And he has complete sets of spectroscopic data for most of GXG peptides in water. And that's wonderful because we can use this data to assess molecular dynamic skills and hopefully in the future improve them. That's the basic idea. So one of the main things that will dominate the rest of the talk what will, uh, is the observation that most gas residues X in GXG peptides adopt substantial amount of polyproline 2 conformation. Now, what is polyproline 2 state? It comes from the polyproline 2 helix that is shown here, which is the type of a helix that is not stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Uh, and it's spontaneously formed by proteins that are rich in, uh, in uh, for example, proline. And such is, for example, collagen is an example of such protein. So if you look at this polyproline 2 helix, from the top, you see a threefold structure. But the interesting thing, this is stabilized on its own. It, it's not stabilized by hydrogen bonds, like uh, different types of alpha helices or 310 helices and, and such that are typical for proteins. So, so, so this is a puzzle. So here is, here, here, uh, this is a complicated slide, but what I want to say is the following. So we have, 
a, a, a two types of spectroscopic data for, for example, for central alanine in GAG or in three alanine peptide. We have five J coupling constants. So this is NMR data. And we have amide one prime profiles. All these data are very sensitive to phi and psi uh, angles. And therefore, if you have a combination of these spectroscopic data, you can devise, you can use the Gaussian decomposition model where you would say that the Ramachandran distribution is like a sum of Gaussians. They are located in the characteristic regions in the uh, Ramachandran plot where you would expect uh, the secondary, you know, the, the structural elements to appear. And so you can use the, that kind of a model that has nothing to do with molecular dynamic simulations to actually find the best fit of these Gaussians to experimental data. And so what you get in the case of GAG is this picture here. Uh, can you see my mouse moving around? Yeah, okay, thank you. So this region here is this polyproline two region. So alanine, and if you do the same thing for the gas residue uh, alanine in AAA, the polyproline is even more pronounced. Um, so first of all, uh, this, uh, th this Gaussian model uh, Ramachandran distributions will serve as a benchmark when we're now trying to compare what molecular dynamics force fields do. Uh, because you can then, after you do the modeling and the fitting, you can then use the Ramachandran distributions, whether they come from this Gaussian model or from MD simulations, and you can calculate all these five J coupling constants and MI1 profiles, and then construct the error function to see how well they reproduce the experimental data. Now, Gaussian model was constructed to reproduce the experimental data, but of course, these error functions will not be exactly zero, even for the Gaussian model, right? But so it can serve as a benchmark. So, so, so this is what we've done first for Ramachandran distributions for alanine in GAG, and we've taken a series of force field water model combinations that you can see them here. There's a mistake on this charm. This is charm 36M. So this is the latest version of charm, um, just uh, to, to clarify that. Now, if you compare these Ramachandran distributions that come from MD simulations with different force fields, you will see that they're very different from, from, the, from this one, right? This is the Gaussian model. So, Okay, let's see how well they reproduce experimental data. And so for that, we show, so this, again, another complicated picture, that for each of these J coupling constants, you can calculate the differences between the calculated and experimental J coupling constant. A, uh, G uh, is the Gaussian model. If you see all these, um, uh, the, for, for Gaussian, the red lines, uh, are sort of a, a measure of an error. Whatever is below the red line is really not important, it's already good. Whatever is above the red line is not performing so well. So Gaussian model you see work is for the most part the best uh, in reproducing J-coupling constants. So if you combine all the, these J-coupling constants, then you get this error function, reduced uh, chi-square function, which shows that G as Gaussian model performs the best when this reduced chi-square function is below two, we're happy. But most of the four force fields produce very high values of chi-square J coupling constant. And if you, if you compare the MI1 profiles, which are shown here, then you can get chi-square VCD uh, function. And even worse is the reproduction of MI1 five profiles. Um, so, so all these values ideally should be roughly below two for us to be happy. So, so there's a problem, right? Now, we, so, so there are two issues. First is that uh, molecular dynamics force fields don't perform well, uh, even for alanine, which is the simplest chiral uh, uh, residue. But the other question is, but why is PP2 conformation favored by most amino acid residues in water? Alanine is true, has the highest amount, but the question is, 
the, so uh, the I have tried to understand as group had produced data for many uh, amino acid residues and most of, in most of them PP2 dominates. So why is that? So then we asked ourselves, well, is that, because, is that an effect of side chain? Like is alanine a special side chain that you know, causes the formation of this PP2? Or does it have to do with the backbone? Because all the amino acids share the backbone. So, so we said, okay, let's examine cationic GGG. That's an achiral peptide because glycine is an achiral amino acid. And let's find out uh, what are glycine's propensities, glycine's Ramachandran distribution. And there comes the probably one of the biggest shocks in the discovery. Everybody assumes that glycine is the most flexible amino acid and it should populate most of the Ramachandran, uh, allow the Ramachandran space. Turns out the answer is no, it doesn't. Other than the fact that the Ramachandran distribution here uh, has inversion symmetry because glycine is achiral, you see that the most populated state is also uh, overlaps with PP2, it's just shifted a little bit upward, upward. So glycine is a lot less flexible than we think. Of course, it, because it can form uh, right-handed and left-handed conformations, it is more flexible than alanine, for example, but it has significant amount of PP2 conformation. And so then the question was, why is that? So why is the, uh, the backbone so important? So first of all, when we assessed AMBER, OPL, the latest uh, 14SB uh, AMBER, the latest OPLS and CHAN 36M, we figured that chi-square J coupling constants are the best reproduced in CHAN 36M. Uh, not so much in AMBER and OPLS. Uh, Chi-square VCD is special in this case because uh, uh, three glycine is an achiral molecule. So uh, the amide profile is exactly equal to zero. That's why this A that corresponds to Gaussian model uh, has zero signal. It turns out that uh, this level of a sig that this level of Chi-square VCD that we found in even in CHAN that looks like a menacing, it's really not a problem because it's still below the experimental error bar. So, so we can, in the case of glycine, we can simply forget about this chi square VCD. Uh, so CHARM 36M does work uh, quite well. All right, so this is a detailed uh, comparison to spectroscopic data. I'm not going to go into details. Um, but, so the interesting thing is, what is so special about PP2 that glycine favors to go into PP2? It turns out that the PP2 is the mesostate in which water can form the most hydrogen bonds with the backbone. And that stabilizes the PP2 state. And it's a property of the backbone of all amino acids. And of course, then the side chains will, will modulate the amount of PP2 because of their conformational preferences. But it basically comes from a PP2. And we also then tested that in simulations, we replaced water by, by DMSO, which is less polar than water, forms fewer hydrogen bonds. And also by completely nonpolar uh, uh, solvent, CCL4, that cannot form hydrogen bonds. And of course, not surprisingly, when we did that, all this uh, in the DMSO, uh, these regions in PP2 became less populated at the account of uh, a right-handed helical region. And in CCL4, they practically completely disappeared. So, um, so that gave us this insight. And so consequences are that glycine-rich proteins are stiff because they form PP2 helices. And it just happens that Sosni Group in 2017 reported the three-dimensional structure, the folded structure of glycine-rich snow flea uh, antifreeze protein that lacks any hydrophobic core, lacks alpha helices or beta sheets, but instead it ex exhibits PP2 helices and it formed perfectly stiff, you know, three-dimensional native bulk. So this is uh, sort of uh, goes along with our uh, discoveries. But let's go back to the assessment of molecular dynamics force fields. Well, we tested uh, AMBER-19SB, which is amino acid specific 
in, in the sense that the, func the dihedral function in that amber force field has a specificity, amino acid specificity. We checked amber 14 SB and the, uh, the newest OPLS and CHAN 36M. We tested um, these force fields in the same way as we tested alanine and glycine on 14, total in 14 amino acids that includes five aliphatic, two aromatic, three ionizable, and four polar. And these are the chi-square functions. And again, looking at the data in detail is a, I'll just confuse you and bore you, so I don't want to do that. I just want to point out that first, the Gaussian model of, um, reproduces much better results than any MD force field. Uh, second, there are specific amino acids for which the force fields are particularly bad. One is um, uh, protonated aspartic acid, as you see here, the, the very large peaks. The other one is, for example, cysteine. And the, the, another one is strionine. In fact, all polar amino acids, CNST, are quite bad, uh, not well reproduced. Uh, for example, isoleucine, it looks like it's well reproduced here. But if you look at the details, you see that the Ramachandran distribution is missing an essential part in the isoleucine specifically likes to populate parallel beta um, uh, region, and that's not reproduced in any of the molecular dynamics force fields. Bridget, are you have like two minutes, sorry, so, yes. you know. Yeah. So I don't want to go in details here, oops, uh, because that's too much, but let me just uh, conclude. Um, so we are, are, first of all, we figured out that PP2 stabil is stabilized by hydrogen bonds between water and functional backbone groups of gas residues, so the backbone is important, and then the side chain only modulates this PP2. Uh, the Gaussian modeling outperforms all force fields in reproducing spectroscopic data, but this table shows that it, it um, outperforms by at least one order of magnitude, because you can calculate this chi-square, average chi-square function over all 14 residues, and chi-square VCD. And you see the Gaussian model performs great because these values on average are below two. So Gaussian model is really good. All the force fields, but the best of the force fields produces like 15, between 15 and 16 chi-square, um, uh, chi-square J. And AMBER 19 as B, which in some aspects is better than the other force fields, is that the, if you just look at the chi-square values, you see that it's much worse than other force fields. So one of the biggest problems is that there's no gas residue specificity. Uh, residues in molecular dynamics, alanine, uh, alanine uh, experimental data shows that it has the largest PP2 content. However, the MD force fields underestimate this content. However, if I, if I can show only one uh, uh, slide, will be that when the Gaussian model shows a large diversity in the Ramachandran distributions among the polar residues, most force fields produce virtually the same Ramachandran distribution that is reaching PP2, too much PP2. So, so the, there's no gas residue specificity in molecular dynamics force fields, or it's insufficient, or it's wrong if it's based on coil library. So, the, so there are some recommendations, but of course, how to improve that, that's a big challenge. So with that, I would just like to thank uh, my students and my collaborators, the two people who have done the most work, Brian Andrews is a star. He's done most in this uh, molecular dynamics assessment, uh, but that work started with Xu Ting Zhang, and so they worked in collaboration. So they were a power team until Xu Ting left for a postdoctoral position. So with that, I also want to thank NSF for funding and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Brigitte, for, <clears throat> for a wonderful talk. <clears throat> so in the interest of time, we are going to move on to the next speaker, but audience, there were many questions for you, Brigitte. Audience, please stay on. At the end of both talks, we have this 15-minute window where you know we will take questions for both of you, and you can answer these questions, Brigitte, at the end.